Hello there. It's my privilege to be considering with you the Word of God today, and I'd like to draw your attention to some verses that we find recorded in Colossians chapter 1. I want to draw your attention to the phrase at the end of verse number 13 of Colossians chapter 1, where Paul's attention is drawn to the person of God's dear Son, the Son of his love, it might be rendered. And having introduced the Lord Jesus Christ, his pen is drawn to record some tremendous words with regard to the person, the character of the Lord Jesus. And it's those verses that I'd like to consider with you briefly in this recording. So we'll read from one uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 13, and it speaks of God having delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. We trust that God will bless our consideration of his good word to each of us. Paul is writing here to Christians who lived in Colossae from a period of confinement in Rome. It's what we know as being one of the prison epistles. There are three of those that Paul wrote from Rome when under some form of house arrest that we read of at the end of the Acts of the Apostles. We find that he penned a letter to Ephesians, he wrote to the church at Philippi, and he also wrote this epistle to the church at Colossae. He also penned a private letter to a friend of his by the way of Philemon. But these epistles were, were written from that period in his experience when he wasn't just at liberty as he had been to travel around preaching the gospel. He had been taken to appear before the emperor and to present his case as a Roman citizen and he was awaiting the day of his trial. And during that period of time it might have been the case that uh, his fellow believers in the early church era lamented the fact that he had been set aside. Perhaps they felt that the work of the Lord was, was hindered by him being under this house arrest in Rome awaiting trial. I rather think that the apostle didn't dwell upon that confinement in quite that way. We, we read in the first chapter of the epistle to Philippians that far from uh, thinking that the word of God had been hindered and thwarted in any way, the apostle rather saw the great opportunity that had been presented him to take the gospel to places that it may not have reached if he were not to be found in those circumstances. And we find that he had the opportunity of conveying the gospel to even the Praetorian Guard, the, the Guard of the Emperor, an opportunity that perhaps he might not have had had he not been in that period of confinement. We might say 
the Apostle Paul used his lockdown to best effect. And, and so too we, reflecting upon these months of restraint that we've had to endure and, and not being able just to move about at liberty, perhaps we felt that the work of the Lord has been hindered and has not been progressed as it might have been. Well, can I offer to you a perspective that maybe it's been exactly the opposite of that? Maybe the word of God has been publicized and the gospel has been propagated in a far more extensive way as we have found means of doing so that we perhaps weren't employing before. This very medium, for instance, here I am sat in South Wales recording uh, a piece of ministry on the word of God that means that I didn't have to travel to Scotland to deliver it. And so we found means of of getting by. It would be a shame if some of those means were left behind when we are able to gather together in the in the fashion that we would dearly love to do so. And maybe the apostle reflected positively uh, in similar vein of his time in Roman confinement. For you see, he had divulged to him there things that he didn't have revealed to him before that point in time. He, he wrote of things during that period that we have recorded expressly in Ephesians and Colossians that really is elevated truth, truth with regard to the church. He speaks of it as being this mystery, this mysterious relationship between Christ and his church that now is being revealed through the revelation given to the Apostle Paul. And so it was a beneficial time, and, and we still benefit from it today. But also in that period of confinement, he was able to receive visitors. And one and another came to him. The Jews came to him. He debated those Jews, we read at the end of the Acts of the Apostles, with regard to the claims of the Lord Jesus to be Messiah. He also received one or two friends of his. And they brought news of how the, the early church believers were, were faring. And that gave rise in this respect to the epistle that we have in our hand that was penned to the church at Colossae. You see, the apostle received uh, a visit from a man of Epaphras, or Epaphras perhaps, as you might choose to pronounce his name. And he brought to the apostle's attention something that was weighing heavily upon his heart. He brought to the apostle news of a threat that had been introduced into the church in Colossae. Colossae was uh, a fairly insignificant town, maybe a hundred miles into what we know as modern-day Turkey, uh, up uh, the valley from, if you like, Ephesus, that major port uh, that was on the edge, the western edge of what we know as being Turkey today. Colossae was perhaps the most insignificant of places that the apostle wrote to. He wrote an epistle to Roman Christians, to Corinth, to Ephesus. But Colossae is perhaps the least significant of the places that he wrote to. And I think there's a little lesson for us there. It's that very place that the adversary targeted with false teaching and false teachers. Maybe if he could get in by the back door in that insignificant place of Colossae, then he could wreak havoc. And so it was that there were lines of error introduced into the church at Colossae that had they taken root, could have spread like wildfire and, and wrought devastation in the early church. But thankfully, there was a spiritual man in Colossae, this man by the name of Epaphras. And he sensed the danger, and he took that danger to the Apostle Paul, that he might address it. Just as a quick aside, we do well in these days of smallness still to be careful that we guard the door of the local church, that we don't let in just anybody who presents themselves and claim to be Christian. 
for we might just be letting in a charlatan. And when in, the problem is far more difficult to deal with than it is on the doorstep. And so Epaphras went to the Apostle Paul, and he brings to the Apostle's attention things that were awry, that had been introduced into the hearing of the saints in Colossae. And we get a flavour for what those things were in the reading of this epistle, particularly the, the portion that we've read together here in Colossians chapter 1. And we find that the attack was really focused upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the way that the Apostle writes concerning his character, we have a hint at the accusations that were being made against his character, the, the defamation of character that was being leveled against him. And I just want to bring to your attention three aspects of the person of Christ as they are brought to us in this first chapter of Colossians. We want to view the Lord Jesus in three relationships in these verses that we've read together. We want to see his relationship to Godhead. We want to view his relationship to creation. And we want to consider his relationship to the church. These three relationships are brought out in verses number uh, 15 down to verse number 22 in two cycles of thought. For instance, when we consider the relationship of the Lord Jesus to Godhead, we, we have a, a statement at the front half of verse number 15, and it says that he is the image of the invisible God. That's a statement of his relationship to deity. But that thought is revisited in the second cycle, in verse number 19. And we find there that it says, It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Another statement with regard to the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ to deity. Similarly, we have thoughts brought to our attention relative to Christ and creation in two separate places in these verses. The end of verse number 15 says he is the firstborn of every creature. And that's elaborated upon in verse number 16 and 17 in the first cycle of thought. But then we drop down to verse number 20 and we find that that subject matter is revisited, the relationship of Christ to creation. And it speaks of having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. And again, further truth is brought to our attention with regard to the relationship of Christ to creation. The third relationship that I'd like us to consider is the relationship of Christ to the church. In verse number 18, it says, he is the head of the body, the church. But when we drop down to verse number 21, that theme is revisited. And it says, we who were sometimes alienated and enemies in our mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. And it's speaking of a reconciled body of people, the church. And so we have three relationships of the Lord Jesus over these two cycles of thought in Colossians chapter 1. Let's ponder the relationship of Christ to Godhead. And we find in verse number 15 it says, He's the image of the invisible God. That's an interesting phrase. When it says he's the image, it, it's the word icon. And, and that throws into our minds a, a, a picture. An image, an icon, a model, that kind of thing, a representation. Well, this word involves all those thoughts and more. It really speaks of three things, this word icon. It speaks of that which has a likeness of something else. It speaks of that which is a representation of something else. But further still, 
Not only is this a likeness and a representation of something, it's the very manifestation of it. Now that presents for us precious truth and fundamental truth with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ. When it says that he is the image of the invisible God, it's saying that he is the likeness, yes. He is the representation, sure. But more than that, not just is he the likeness and the representation of the invisible God, he is the manifestation of the invisible God. That's fundamental to our Christian foundation. When we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, we think of one who is God manifest in flesh. It's not sufficient to say that he is merely the likeness of the invisible God. And it's not enough to say that he is simply the representation of the invisible God, nor he is the manifestation of God. I have one son. And though it might mortify him to, to think of it, people who knew me when I was his age, they look on him and they say, you, you're the image of your father. Well, I'm not sure if that pleases him or not, really. He's had a vision of the future, maybe. But people will say, you're the image of your father. You see, he's a likeness, and, and that ought to be so. He's my son. More than simply being a likeness of me, he actually is a representation of me, in part. For you see, something like 50% of his DNA comes from me, and the other from Helen, his mother. And so not only is he a likeness of me, but he is a representation of me in some degree. But he's not a manifestation. He's his own personality. He's his own man. He's not me. When we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, whilst he is his own distinct personality, he is the manifestation of God. That's an enormous truth. He is God manifest in flesh. You know, the error that was getting hold of some of these in Colossae was that he was simply an emanation of God. He was a diluted form of God. The apostle says, I'm having none of that. He's the very fullness of Godhead bodily. Verse number 19 says, It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And the man who walked two millennia ago on earth, Jesus of Nazareth, was none other than God manifest in flesh. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. He hath told him out. The Lord Jesus uniquely could say, I and my Father are one. He that hath seen me, hath seen the Father. He was a manifestation of deity as he lived and moved in this scene. Everything that is characteristic of God was resident in him. The fullness of Godhead dwelt in him bodily, and we must insist upon that. That's what the Bible teaches. In the beginning it says, was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word was manifest in bodily form. The Word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. God has been here in human form, in the person of His Son. But not only do we have precious truth with regard to the relationship of the Lord Jesus to deity. He is God manifest. We have precious truth with regard to his relationship to creation. 
Now, the phrase at the end of verse number 15 is, is a favorite phrase of false teachers. The Jehovah's Witnesses will frequently go to this and say that this is a proof text that he's not eternal. Rather, he is a created being. He is less than fully God. No, no, that's not what this phrase means when it says he is the firstborn of every creature. It doesn't mean that he was the first created of every creature. Because you read on into the next verse and you'll find that all that has been created was created by him. And, and when we pick up scripture from elsewhere, John will tell us that all things were created by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So he's not part of the created realm at all. He's outside of it. And that means that he's God. No, when we read that he's the firstborn of every creature, it's really speaking about his status relative to creation. It's speaking about his preeminence. And the Lord Jesus Christ has superiority over creation as being its creator. The philosophers of the day, when they, when they pondered the, the meaning of everything, the, the philosophers of this ancient day reflected that everything had a primary cause that planned it, that had an instrumental cause that produced it, and had a final cause that was the purpose of it all. In verse number 16, the Apostle Paul tells us, with regard to creation, the Lord Jesus is the primary cause that planned it. He is the instrumental cause that produced it. He is the final cause as being the purpose of it all. Notice what it says at the commencement of verse number 16. He's the primary cause that planned it. By him were all things created. It really reads in him. Conceptually, in him were all things created created. He's the one that planned it all. But then at the end of verse number 16, it says he was the instrumental cause of everything. He produced it. It says there, all things were created by him, or literally it might read, all things were created through him. He was the instrumental cause for bringing all things into existence. But then at the end of verse number 16, we find that he is the final cause. He's the purpose of it all. All things were created through him and for him. Ephesians truth says, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God will gather together in one all things in Christ. He's the ultimate goal. His recognition as supreme is God's ultimate design. Ah, oh, but there's a problem just now. This creation has been spoiled by sin. Back in the Garden of Eden. But notice what it says in verse number 20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Part of the effect of the work of the Lord Jesus at Calvary, is to have been establishing the means for the reconciliation of all things. Things that were spoiled by sin will be, will be altered from one state to another and brought back into harmony with the Creator, all as a consequence of the blood of His cross. What an amazing effect the work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary has had Creation will, will groan until the day when it will be regenerated and it's all as a consequence of what he achieved at Calvary. And so we have tremendous things with regard to the relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ 
to creation. With regard to deity, his relationship is one of equality. With regard to creation, his relationship is one of superiority. When we think of his relationship relative to the church, we find that his position is one of authority. It says in verse number 18, he is the head of the body, the church. This is part of that mystery that Paul revealed in his writings from out of his time of confinement in Rome. This mystery, which is this union between Christ and his church. And he presents it in Ephesians and in Colossians as this relationship between a head and a body. When we think of Ephesian truth, the focus is really upon the body. But when we come to Colossian truth, the focus is really upon the head. But it's one entity that is being spoken about this. One new man, to pick up a phrase from Ephesians. This new creation, Christ and his church. And it was revealed from out of confinement in Rome. You know, the early church and the opponents of the early church may have looked upon Paul as being the head of the church in some respect. The one who was driving it forward in his ministry. What now the consequences? If the head is cut off by being confined in Rome, how is the work going to fare? Paul says, no, I'm not the head. The head is in heaven, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And though I be cut off, I know the, the vital head is the one who sits at the right hand of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. And to Paul was given the privilege of revealing this body truth. I think that he had a first indication of this line of thought the day of his conversion. He didn't know it at the time, but I would think that he reflected upon that interaction with the risen Lord Jesus Christ and he appreciated by reflecting that there was a little hint given at this mystery that was going to be revealed to him, the body of Christ, which is the church. You remember the incident when Paul was arrested on his way by a, a light that was brighter than the noonday sun. And a voice came out of heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The voice of the Lord Jesus didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people or my church? No, no. He said, why persecutest thou me? And a little hint is being given at this union between the head in heaven and the body, the church on earth. Every blow that fell upon a child of God was felt by the head consciously. That is still the case. He is still touched by the feeling of our infirmities. For he is one with us in this new entity. What a, what a wonder this is. We've been brought into this position, says verse number 22, by being, sorry, verse number 21, by being reconciled through the body of his flesh, through death, or in the body of his flesh, through death, we've been reconciled. We've been united, brought back into a relationship. This is a very strong word for reconciled here. It really means to be irreversibly reconciled. It's a unique word. That is a Bible word. And it's specifically preserved for the security of our relationship to our risen head. We've been reconciled. We've been united to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that irreversibly. What is the purpose of all that? Well, it is that we might be presented, says verse number 22, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's our prospect, you know. Sinners saved by grace. One day we'll be presented in the condition 
that is representative of his condition, holy, unblameable, unreprovable. Oh, there's, there's plenty that I can be blamed for just now. There, there, there's many a thing that you could, could reprove me over. But in a coming day, I'll be presented in the character that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, holy, unblameable, unreprovable. What a tremendous thing to be saved. What a tremendous thing to be part of this body of people, the church. Mark you, the body does the bidding of the head. The, the head transmits messages. I'll transmit a message to raise my right hand. And, and there goes my right hand. Simply because my body has been observing the will of the head. And the body is the executor of the will of my head. My brain transmits the commands and my body responds. If there's a breakdown in, in, in the conveying of that message, well, I've got a, an illness, I've got a, an affliction that has invaded me. Naturally, the body should respond to the communications, the will of its head. That's true in this spiritual relationship as well. We should be executors of his will. The church should do his bidding. That's what we should be doing now. In a coming day, we will fulfill his purpose without resistance, without deviation. And we shall be the administrators of his will and of his purpose. What a tremendous privilege that belongs to the people of God. I trust that you might reflect upon these three relationships. They are vital relationships. The relationship of Christ to Godhead is one of equality. The relationship of Christ to creation is one of superiority. And the relationship of Christ to his church is one of authority. I trust that you might ponder these things and be blessed thereby for his name's sake.